conflict over America's future can be seen in the parallel lives of two men whose fates are uniquely intertwined with that of the nation over the last 50 years. John Kerry, who is now regrettably our Secretary of State, first stepped onto the stage of national politics in the 1960s. He was a veteran of the Vietnam War who had returned to accuse his comrades in arms and all American servicemen of having committed atrocities. He collaborated with the government of North Vietnam in Paris and opposed any end to the war that did not involve humiliation for his country and victory for its communist enemies. The other individual is John O'Neill. John was in his 20s and served in Vietnam for a year and a half as commander of the swift boat that John Kerry had left after only three brief months of service. John O'Neill knew that the men he had fought alongside of in Vietnam had served honorably. The American media, which also opposed the Vietnam War, had made Kerry into a national figure. John O'Neill, who was a very young man and had no such support, challenged the media to stage a debate between them so that he could defend the men he had fought alongside of in the Vietnam War. The media refused to stage the debate. Only the Dick Cavett show on ABC agreed to do it. The show was also staged against John, and he had to brave a hooting audience of 60s leftists. But John stood tall and spent an hour defending the country he loved and the men with whom he had served. Never in the course of human events have so many been libeled by so few. There were two and a half million of us who served there in Vietnam under the most severe restrictions in this nation's history. We have brought this war close to a close. We never engaged in mass bombing of population centers, as all nations did in World War II. And the reason we did not is because we are a moral people. 55,000 Americans died there in Vietnam, no matter what they thought about the war, because they believed in this country. And those of us who survived came back to this country, by and large determined just to resume our normal lives after the disruption caused by war. We encountered a variety of problems, unemployment, discrimination, other problems. And then we encountered the biggest problem of them all, the big lie by Mr. Kerry and his group, that we were either each individually war criminals or that we were collectively the executioners of a criminal policy. You've seen that all before. It's guilt by association. If one or 50 or 150 veterans testify as to war crimes, then all two and a half million of us must be war criminals. And that is something that we must not stand for in this country. No one has said there'll be a bloodbath if we pull out, which is a cliche we used to hear a lot. Uh, does either of you still think I, that I, would be uh, a... I think if we pull out prematurely before a viable South Vietnamese government is established that the record of the North Vietnamese in the past and the record of the Viet Cong in the area I served in at Operation Sea Float clearly indicates that's precisely what would happen in that country. The true fact of the matter is, uh, Dick, that there's, there's absolutely no guarantee that there would be a bloodbath. There's no guarantee that there wouldn't. One has to obviously conjecture on this. However, I think the arguments clearly indicate that there probably wouldn't be. First of all, uh, if you read back historically, in 1950, the French uh, made statements. There was a speech made by, I think it was General Leclerc, that if they pulled out, uh, France pulled out, then there'd be a bloodbath. There wasn't a bloodbath. Uh, the same for Algeria. Uh, there hasn't been. Uh, I, I think that it's really kind of a baiting argument. There is no interest on the part of the North Vietnamese to try and massacre the people once people have agreed to withdraw. Uh, there's just no purpose. Now, I, I realize that there would be certain political assassinations, and that might take place. And I think, and I think when you balance that against the fact that the United States has now accounted for some 18,600 people through its own Phoenix program, which is a program of assassination, and when you balance that off against the morality of the kind of bombing we've been doing in Laos, and the kind of destruction wholesale of the country of Vietnam, which amounts to some 155,000 civilians a year killed, then I think to talk about four or five thousand people is, is, is lunacy in terms of the, of the overall argument and what we're seeking in Southeast Asia. I, I think John Kerry lost the battle of ideas and facts on the Dick Cavett show that night, but supported by his membership in a radical movement that had marched from the streets into the ranks of the Democratic Party, he went on to achieve a political career 
that had been his ambition long before he went to war in Vietnam. John O'Neill chose a private life, becoming a successful attorney and clerking for Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist. He focused on his family, his two children and his wife, Anne, donating a kidney to her when she became ill and caring for her in her last days. Kerry went on to become a United States Senator and in 2004 became the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. Kerry's step towards the summit of power came in the middle of another war, the war with Islamo-fascism that began on September 11, 2001. Kerry was briefly for that war. He voted to authorize the invasion of Iraq and then when Americans were fighting in the field, he and the rest of the Democratic Party turned their backs on the war and attacked America's mission in Iraq as illegal and immoral, just as he had America's mission in Vietnam 35 years before. I'm John Kerry, and I'm reporting for duty. Now a private citizen, John O'Neill still remembered how Kerry had attacked his comrades in arms and dishonorably discharged his duties in Vietnam. He contacted dozens of men who had served with Kerry in Vietnam and found that they were equally disturbed that a man who had stabbed his country in the back was now poised to become its commander in chief. John sat down and wrote a book which told how Kerry had filed phony claims of heroism during his brief time in the field of battle, exaggerated his wounds, campaigned for medals he later threw away, and lied about having been sent on a secret mission, an illegal mission, to Cambodia. John helped to create television advertisements telling the truth about Kerry, in which he appeared alongside with other swift boat veterans who had served with him. John Kerry, you have claimed your most heroic moment in Vietnam came on March the 13th, 1969, in an incident that you called No Man Left Behind. The truth is, John Kerry, you took a small truth and you weaved a huge lie around it. You took the tragedy of other people and you tried to portray yourself as a hero in circumstances where your conduct was dishonorable and your, your actions were cowardly. Over 150,000 Americans contributed to the Swift Boat Veterans Campaign for Truth. Over half of all Americans who voted saw those ads. John Kerry went down to defeat. In helping to make that possible, John O'Neill had also struck a blow for our fighting men and women serving in the war on terror, as well as those who had served in Vietnam. In accepting the David Horowitz Freedom Center's Annie Taylor Award in 2004, John said that he felt that the outcome of the election meant that those he had served with over three decades before could finally come home with the honor individuals such as John Kerry had denied them at the time. The message was first that our service and those of our friends who died in Vietnam was honorable, that they were not war criminals, that it was not a criminal cause. Thank you. We'll never forget you. Not ever. Not any of us. John O'Neill helped stop John Kerry in 2004, but the anti-American movement Kerry became part of has continued to make inroads in our political culture. It has now captured not only the State Department, but the White House itself. The David Horowitz Freedom Center's mission is to defend American freedom at home and abroad. We do not concede that the battle is lost. We are glad to be able to undertake the work that has been cut out for us, to oppose efforts to fundamentally transform America and to promote the virtues that have always made this country exceptional. We are proud to have before us the example of our friend and board member, John O'Neill. The truths and heroism that John O'Neill has embodied in his moments on the public stage are the very virtues that will continue to keep us and our country free.